Hey everybody, I'm Jason Bent. Welcome back to the channel. And in today's video, I'm gonna walk you through step-by-step -step how to make a frameless cabinet with a full overlaid door. We'll go over the carcass construction as well as the hinge and door installation. So when we're talking about cabinets, uh, there's really two specific types of cabinets uh, that come to mind and have different variations. You have a frameless cabinet, and then you have one with a face frame. Now there's pros and cons to both of those and it depends on what kind of look you're going for. With a face frame application, you're gonna have much larger reveals and with a frameless application, you're gonna have much thinner, cleaner reveals. Now when it comes to frameless cabinets, which is what you see here, you typically are gonna have your full overlay or some sort of overlay and then you're gonna have inset. And inset, obviously there's no overlay because the drawers and door fronts are even with the front of the cabinet. And that is the design that I went with on my miter saw station. Now this example is a frameless full overlay and that's what we're gonna be talking about today. We're gonna to start by identifying some of the different pieces that we're gonna be using. For this video, I actually have all of my pieces cut with the exception of a couple I'll talk about here in just a minute. So starting from my left, we have the two side panels, we have the top and bottom, we have what will be an adjustable shelf, we have a couple of nailers, and then I have my material, which is gonna be my back panel, and then I have my material, which is going to be the door. Let's quickly go over some common sizes that you're gonna find with a traditional upper cabinet. Typically, upper cabinets are gonna be anywhere from about the 30 inch range to the 42 inch range if it's a single standalone cabinet. And then things can vary based on, let's say you wanna build a 30 inch and then you wanna build like a 12 inch separate cabinet above it for additional storage or something like that. The common depths that you're gonna find with upper cabinets is 12 inches to 20 four inches and then some of the common widths that you're going to find are anywhere from you know 9 to 12 inches all the way up to 36 inches with all that being said the example that i'm making in this video is actually a 30 inch tall cabinet it is 12 inches deep and it is 18 inches wide so because i already have my top bottom and sides cut the first step that we're gonna do is actually go ahead and cut the groove that's going to accept the panel. So let's start walking through that process. Before I get into showing you uh, the layout that we're gonna do for the grooves, I wanted to highlight something here. And so this is the exact same piece of plywood. It's just this side is one side and this side is the other. And so something that I'm always looking for, especially in an application like this where I want the inside of my cabinet to look nicer. I would select this to be the interior portion of the cabinet and this to be the exterior portion since this is not going to be seen. So I need to make sure that I account for that when I'm figuring out where I want my grooves to be because one groove will need to be at the back of the cabinet here, the other groove will need to be at the back of the cabinet here. So just something to pay attention to. And the same thing applies to the top and bottom. I obviously want the top and bottom to match the look of the sides, so I need to identify what those faces are. Okay, so right now I'm looking at the two cabinet sides. I've got the backs facing inward, because again, I need to make sure that the grooves are in the back of the panel. And so something that we wanna be aware of is that we're gonna have nailers in the back. And these nailers are going to be there to give my screw something to go through and drill into the studs and provide a little bit of extra support. So with that being said, if I was to bring it over here, I wanna make sure that this is flush with the end because my groove needs to start here. And when it starts here, I need to make sure it's the proper thickness for the panel that I'm gonna use, which in this case is a quarter inch or six millimeter plywood. And then that way I can start my cut and when I go to put everything together, this will actually fit in right behind it and be perfectly flush with the back of the cabinet. I'm not using anything special. I'm actually just gonna use a single, you know, full kerf blade and just creep up on the fit because quarter inch plywood is not a quarter of an inch. So it's a lot easier for me to do it this way. But the way that I'm gonna get that spacing is I'm just gonna use the material that is going to be behind it to set the spacing of my fence. That way I know that I'm setting it perfectly right off the bat. And once I get it set, I should be able to just drop it down, nice snug fit, but not too tight. And now I know that when I make my first cut, I'm gonna move the fence over and it'll allow enough space for this board. So the next step is gonna be setting the height. Now, when setting the height, I like to use uh, setup blocks. Uh, there's a lot of different ways you can do this. You can use the material itself, but for me, I just find the setup blocks the easiest. So it looks like that's my highest point. So I'm gonna bring my blade down just a little bit and it looks like now I'm perfectly flush. Now the depth that I like to go uh, is eight millimeters on 18 millimeter ply, eight to 10 millimeters, somewhere around half the halfway mark. Uh, this is an eight millimeter setup block. So once I have this set, we're good to go. 
So one thing that I like to do is actually bring my material over to the table saw and actually lay everything face down so I can basically take it just so you don't get mixed up and I can run it through and I know everything is good to go. And while I'm doing this, you'll notice that because I want the clean side to be on the interior, that's where I need to cut. So I'm looking at the non-clean side. All right, so now I'm gonna go ahead and make my first pass on all of these. Now, this last piece that you saw me just cut, this is just a scrap of the same material that I'm using for the cabinet. And the reason I did this is because now that I've made my first pass, I'm gonna go ahead and start to shift this over and I wanna creep up on the cut to where it is exactly the fit of the panel. And so, because I don't wanna overshoot it, I just use this scrap. But now I can go ahead and do that. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna go ahead and move my fence over, not quite an eighth of an inch. You know, maybe about a sixteenth of an inch or a couple millimeters, and I'm gonna make another cut. All right, so now I can actually take this piece and test it before actually cutting the rest of my pieces. What we're looking for is a nice snug fit, but not too tight. And that actually uh, is really, really good. That's exactly what I want. I can move it around. It's not too hard to get on. Fits just fine. So now I can actually go ahead and make the cuts on everything else because the fence is already set. And here I'll bring you in close to show you what I was talking about with the nailer and having it be nice and flush to the back. Once I put that on there, that panel will not be inhibited by my nailers. Okay, so what's next? Before I mention this is an upper cabinet and realistically you're probably gonna have one at least, probably two, uh, you know, shelves that are gonna be in it. And something that I wanna point out is I've already cut this prior to because I knew what all my measurements were gonna be. And something that I wanna point out is when you're cutting your shelves, obviously they need to fall a little bit short of where that back panel's gonna be, just to give you that flexibility. And then the other thing is that whatever the width of this bottom panel is, I usually will take off about an eighth of an inch from the actual shelf, just so it's not tight in there. It gives you about a sixteenth of an inch wiggle room on each side or a couple millimeters. Now for this application, we're just gonna put an adjustable shelf in the center and this is 30 inches tall. So we're gonna go, you know, 15 inches is the center. I'm gonna go ahead and mark one at the front, really just for the demonstration. I'm gonna mark one more towards the back just kind of as, as a reference. And there's a lot of different ways that you can do this. We're just gonna do, you know, three holes in the front and back on each panel just to make this go a little bit faster. Um, Obviously not everybody has an LR32 system from Festool to make this very simple. So there's other techniques that you can do. There's some great jigs on the market that you can add these holes. Uh, me personally, I actually like to use my uh, Woodpecker's TS rule because these holes are actually spaced out 32 millimeters, uh, which is a whole other conversation we won't dive too deep into in this video. But something that you can do is you can kind of just use one of these as a reference and as long as you know where your center hole is, so in this instance, this is gonna be my center hole. So I'm just gonna do these three. And something that you can do is since this already has holes in it and you're referencing off of the bottom of the board, as long as you do the same thing with each one, you know, you'll be fine. So this is actually a five millimeter bit, which is the size of the shelf pin holes. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna use the inside set of lines. I'm gonna take this self-centering bit, push it down, make a mark, make a mark, make a mark. I'm gonna slide it to the back and I'm gonna do the same thing on the other. Like I mentioned before, there are a lot of really nice jigs out there to make this a very simple process. I just don't have any of those jigs. And I'm trying to do this in a way that is a little bit more relatable. So my hole, make my hole. Basically what this is doing is it's just ensuring that that pointed bit is going to be centered and I have the same reference on both the front and the back. So now we're good to go. I'm just gonna drill these out real quick with this same bit and we'll move on to the next step. And this is just something that is helpful it is by no means necessary. I want to create a reference line. So I know my plywood is 18 millimeters thick. So I wanna find a center line on that. So I'm gonna use my rule and I'm gonna mark 
nine millimeters all the way down. Now, the reason that I'm doing this is because this just gives me a quick reference for my screw locations and my staples once I get to that point. Before I get into the assembly, let's go ahead and cut our back panel now just because it'll make the assembly process much easier. And also to be clear, you don't have to use a back panel, but typically on an upper cabinet, you're definitely gonna want it because you don't wanna open up the cabinet and then see the wall behind it and see the nailers. So this is just a way to one, cover up the nailers, and two, just give the interior of the cabinet a nice look. So to determine the width of our back panel, we, we need to understand the width of our top and bottom of the cabinet. So in this case, we've got 423 millimeters. Now, going back to the depth of cut that I made for these channels, we know that I cut eight millimeters into each one. So that gives us a total of 16. So we should add 16 millimeters to this cabinet. Me personally, I like to drop a millimeter off of that just to give a little bit of room. So in this instance, we are going to add 15 and that gives us 438 millimeters wide. So now let's determine the height that we need. So first measurement I need is the side of my cabinet, which is 763, so 763. Now I wanna know the thickness of my top and bottom together. And in this case, we're actually looking at 35. So 763 minus 35 is 728. So that is my opening space. Now, because I need to go into the groove for the top and bottom, we're again going to add 15 millimeters, giving us that one millimeter buffer. And that is going to be the total length of the back panel. So 728 plus 15 is 743. So we have 743 by 438. That's how big the panel needs to be, so we're gonna go cut that. And this is again another reason why I prefer using metric because figuring out the numbers to me is just so much easier than having to deal with a bunch of uh, fractions and 30 seconds and 64ths and eighths and everything else. All right, so now let's go ahead and get into the assembly. And the assembly method that I'm gonna show you uh, is the most simple, basic method. Now, uh, again, this method is assuming that these cabinets are gonna go side by side and the sides are not visible. Say if you were redoing a kitchen or it was in part of an enclosed uh, portion of the wall, this is my favorite method for constructing the carcass. And so it starts with me using a flat reference surface, this being my table. I have my line here. I have the back of the cabinet here that lines up at the back of the cabinet there. Everything is flush. So what I'm gonna be doing is I'm gonna be using a narrow crown stapler and I'm gonna have a couple of staples along this line. And that's just to give it some bite and some holding power because that makes putting in the screws much, much easier. And you can do the same thing with a brad nailer. I just prefer using a narrow crown stapler. So now I can let go. It has plenty of holding power and this is gonna allow me the opportunity to go ahead and get some screws in it. A very common question I get is what screws I like to use for cabinets. And I pretty much exclusively use Power Pro screws um, for a couple of reasons. But the biggest reason is that they self tap very, very, very well. And in most cases, it doesn't require any pre drilling whatsoever. So, depending on the material you're using, in a lot of cases, I can just screw that screw in and it doesn't split the wood and it actually dives into that wood really, really well and countersinks itself really well and pretty clean overall. Typically on cabinet applications, uh, I usually will pre-drill, but uh, in times where I just don't want to and I wanna get stuff thrown together real quick, uh, that's one of the reasons why I really like using those screws. And that's another reason why having this line is actually very helpful because it ensures that I'm not so close to the edge that I might have the tendency to split the wood. And again, this plywood is some pretty good quality plywood, so it allows me to do it. So I'll go ahead and do these without pre-drilling. The other common question I get is how long of a screw I use. These are inch and three quarter. Uh, that's pretty much my go-to for this application. Sometimes I use two, sometimes I use inch and a half, but these I find to be really good. All right, so I got my screws and on something this deep, typically I'll do three, sometimes I'll do four or five. It just, for this video, I'm just gonna do three. It's more than enough holding power. All right, so now we're gonna go ahead and put this back panel in there. Sometimes you just gotta make sure it's not caught up on anything. There we go. And as you can see, I've got a little bit of clearance here to allow for that top panel. We'll go ahead and check 
Uh, typically that panel is gonna help square this up, but as long as you know, cut everything nice and square, everything should be nice and square as you go ahead and assemble it. So now we can go ahead and get the top on. Finally, the last side. Right on that line. And if you don't feel comfortable, uh, you know, just screwing without pre-drilling, well, this is again where that line comes in really handy. Just use the appropriate size countersink bit, screw your holes, drill your holes, rather. And there we go, we have a box. Before we get into doing the door, we have one more thing that we need to add to this cabinet, and that is the nailers. And so what we're gonna do is we're gonna place one at the top and one at the bottom. And again, that's to give you something to screw through the cabinet to hold it to the wall into a stud. Now, before I said, let's assume that this cabinet is hanging on a wall and I have another cabinet right next to it and another cabinet right next to it. The way the sides look do not matter, right? But what if you needed one side, say it's at the end, you have a wall on one end and you need it to be visible on the other end. Well, there's a lot of things you can do. You can put a, a laminate over it, you can build a decorative panel for it, or you can make it to where the screws are not visible. And a way that you can do that is with pocket holes, which is perfect for cabinetry. So in this application, I'm gonna show you putting in these nailers using pocket holes and that's to alleviate the need to drive screws through the top and bottom, even though realistically the top and bottom of this cabinet would not be visible. However, for the purposes of this video, let's use some pocket holes. Now, because I cut these at the same time I cut my tops and bottoms, they should be a perfect fit. And as you can see, they are. So I just slide it in there, push it down. Everything is nice and flush. And so the only thing left to do is use some pocket screws and screw this thing in place. So to recap, we built the carcass for a frameless cabinet. Now we're gonna talk about putting a full overlay door on. For this door, I'm just using a plywood panel simply for the instructional purposes of this video. If you would like to see a video on how you can make shaker style doors uh, using just a table saw and a single blade, I will leave a link to that video that I have down in the video description. So now we're gonna get into actually determining the size of the door that we want. And there's a few things that you need to consider for this. One, you obviously need to know which hinges you're using because each hinge might have different specifications. The next thing is you wanna identify how big you want your reveal to be. And then the third thing you wanna consider is, is there another cabinet next to this that is also going to have a door because that's going to affect your measurements. So for this instance, it is a single cabinet. We're gonna do a two millimeter reveal all the way around. And here shortly, I'm gonna be showing you exactly which hinge we are going to be using. So let's get some measurements and figure out exactly how big the door panel has to be. All right, so the first measurement that we need to know, let's go with the width. And the width of this cabinet is 18 inches as we discussed earlier, but that is actually 458 millimeters. And the height of the cabinet I mentioned before was 30 inches, which is, 762 millimeters. And I mentioned before that I wanna have a two millimeter reveal all the way around. This is a single cabinet, one door, and I wanna have a nice even reveal all the way around. So we're gonna do two millimeters. So what do we need to do? We know that this is 762. So if I want a two millimeter reveal at the top and a two millimeter reveal at the bottom, then we know I need to be 758 millimeters. And if this is 458, we need to subtract four from that, so 454. So that is the size that we need to cut for this panel. All right, so let's give it a quick test here. Two millimeters, just wanna make sure that I'm where I need to be. And I am. So let's go ahead and start the process of the hinges. Before we get into the hinge insulation, I wanna show you the hinges that I'm using. These are the Bloom full overlay hinges and these are the plates. And we're gonna walk through the steps for each one of these. And uh, I'll leave the, the part numbers for these if you wanted to use these exact same hinges down in the video description. But these ones specifically are for full overlay doors. And here I just wanted to show you a difference between uh, two different hinges. So these are for the full overlay, which is what we're using in this video. And then this is the same model Bloom hinge. However, this is for an inset door. And as you can see, it's a pretty significant difference between the two, the way that they're laid out. However, both of them can use the same plates. So let's make this as simple as possible. We need to identify where we need the actual plate 
to go. Not necessarily the depth that it goes from the front edge just yet, but where we need the actual plate. And to make this very simple, we're gonna measure from the outside edge of the cabinet, we're gonna measure 100 millimeters. And we're gonna mark a line. We're gonna mark a line at the bottom and we're gonna do the exact same thing to the top. Now, the next thing that I wanna do is I wanna transfer that line on the inside of the cabinet. This is gonna be my reference line for the hinge plate. I'm gonna do that there and I'm gonna do that again at the top. Okay, so now we have our reference line. That reference line is for this. And what this is, is this is a jig that gives you the proper spacing to pre-drill your holes. Now let's talk about this for a second. This jig specifically works perfectly for these hinge plates. And what I mean by that is that the distance that the holes need to be drilled are 37 millimeters from the edge of the cabinet and the spacing for the holes is 32 millimeters. Where do you find that information? Just about every hinge comes with instructions or the instructions can be found online. And in this instance with Bloom, you can actually get a catalog from Bloom that has all the information in it. So this little jig just makes it very handy. This is from Rockler. Uh, they're relatively inexpensive. You don't have to have these, but they have all different layouts for different hinges, whether it's inset, whether it's full overlay. So what we need to do now is bring that over to the line that's on it, covers our reference line. And once we have it in place, then we're gonna take a self-centering drill bit and we're gonna drill those holes out. I'm just gonna hold this in place. And there we go. Now I have my pre-drilled hole locations for the plate. And once we drill our holes, we're gonna go ahead and put our hinge plate on the inside of the cabinet here. So I like to start with one screw and I don't tighten it down quite all the way tight. I'm gonna take my second screw. Still want a little bit of movement in there. Line that up with the hole, screw in my second. And these are self-centering, so you'll see it adjust just like it did right there, just a little bit. Not quite all the way tight. Let this one budge if it needs to and we're good to go. And the orientation that you put these in, these rest on a little bar on the back side of the hinge, and this little hole right here actually goes towards the inside of the cabinet. So just an easy reference, uh, but if you make some jigs, because um, you use a lot of you know the same hardware, uh, it's an easy reference for the future. Okay, so now we need to install the hinges on the back side of the door. And so before, we measured 100 millimeters from the edge. Well, we already know that we took four millimeters off of this door total to give us a two millimeter reveal all the way around. So that means that I need to measure from 98 from the top, 98 from the bottom, make my line, and that's how I can ensure that it all lines up properly. Same thing applies. I'm gonna give myself a nice reference line, and now we go to the drill press. With just about every one of these Euro style hinges that I know of, you're gonna need a 35 millimeter uh, Forstner bit, and that's what this is right here. The next thing is you need to understand what the tab is what it's referred to, is for the hinge that you're using. And those hinges specifically call for a five millimeter tab. And what the tab is, is the distance from the edge of the door to the edge of the hole that you're drilling. And all this little piece of plastic is, again, this is another uh, jig from Rockler that I bought that just comes in really handy. You can make these out of plywood or uh, MDF and just have these templates laying around, but this just helps set this drill bit up a lot faster. So what I'm gonna be doing here is setting my fence location to where I know that my fence is five millimeters away from the cutter. It's really easy to do. You just drop the drill bit down into the hole that's already there, and then you can bring your fence right up against it. And once you have your fence up against it, you can hold it in place and tighten it down. And then just to double check, come back down, and we're good to go. All right, now once I have my drill bit set, it's now time to go ahead and cut it to the desired depth which you can uh, play with a little bit. You can keep some scrap pieces around in your shop. But what I'm doing right now is I'm using the point of that Forstner bit and using that line as a reference. So once I know I'm in the right spot, uh, the drilling depth that I typically go on these is right around the 13 millimeter mark. So I'm gonna go ahead and drill my hole. And before I do this, to be clear, you don't need to do this at a drill press by any means. There's lots of really good jigs. You can use a drill, makes it very easy. I just like to use the drill press. So after we've drilled our hinge cup location, I can put my hinge in, use a square just to make sure everything lines up, and then we'll go ahead and pre-drill those holes. And just to make sure it stays nice and steady. Then I can take my screws, place them in their corresponding holes, and I follow a similar procedure for these, and I tighten one down uh, close to being tight, 
I just go to the other one uh, just to allow it to center itself tight, tighten that down, and then I'll install the hinge on the other side. All right, so let's go ahead and clip this door in real quick. Make sure everything lines up. Once you get it lined up, it should just snap into place just like that. Snap into place. Go ahead and close it. And now the only thing left to do is make some minor adjustments because right now I'm pretty much flush. So I want to come over just a couple of millimeters and possibly maybe come up just a little bit. So let me show you how to do that. Okay, so there are various adjustments uh, that you can make for these hinges. And the first one that you'll see right here, this is if I need to move the panel left or right. So I can simply adjust this and I need to go to the right just a little bit. So that's one adjustment that you can make. You can also push the door in and out by using this screw. And then this screw down here on the bottom actually will loosen the plate. And if you do both of them, you can actually shift this up or down a little bit if needed. I have the necessary adjustments I needed to make for my door. And as you can see, it opens up. The only thing left to do is we need to put in our adjustable shelf. And this will go in here just like so. Nice and flush in the front, nice and tight to the back soft close, and just like that. Full overlay door, frameless cabinet, really, really simple to build. And if you have a lot of these to do and you start to get down in a rhythm, I mean, you can knock these things out really, really quick. Nice, clean look. Uh, it would definitely look better if I had a different door on it, uh, but that would have made this video way too long. So hope you guys found that helpful. Okay, so that's gonna do it for this video. If you found that information helpful, consider subscribing. Hit the notification bell and all the other things that everybody always asks you to do. If you guys wanna find out more about what I'm doing or if you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments section down below or go over to Instagram. You can find me there at Bents Woodworking. You can shoot me a message. I'd be happy to answer any questions that you might have. And finally, if you wanna see everything that I'm doing and everything that I offer or you wanna help support me and my channel, head over to my website, bentswoodworking.com. Until next time, everybody, get out in the shop, try something new, and I'll see you in the next video. Thanks.